you. Thank you. Thank you and welcome, I'm Father Mitch Packle. Welcome to Threshold of Hope, where we take a look at the writings of the church. And before we get to today's document, Veritati Splendor, I want to mention that it is the Feast of the Evangelist, St. Luke. He began to accompany St. Paul uh, on his way to Philippi. This would have been about the year 50. It, he, seemed, he met up with St. Paul in Western uh, Asia Minor in Troas, which is where ancient Troy used to be. And then, and how can we tell that? Because in Acts of the Apostles said, they did this, they did this, and then from Troas, then we set sail for Neapolis, and then we went to Philippi. And then he, Paul leaves him behind, and we see that Paul travels around, comes back to Philippi, and then from Philippi, then we set sail. Okay, so we can tell that he was with Paul uh, in the year 50, and then again in the year 58, he joins up with him and goes with him to the Holy Land, where Paul's about to celebrate the Feast of Pentecost in Jerusalem. And Paul got arrested, and apparently St. Luke stayed with him because the rest of Acts of the Apostles speaks about, we did this and we sailed, and he was with St. Paul on the journey to Rome, and writes about it. In fact, that is the most detailed section of Acts of the Apostles, which St. Luke wrote along with the Gospel of Luke. So he does that, and it's important to note all that because it's while St. Luke was with Paul between 58, the spring of 58, and late autumn of 59 AD, that he got to meet the different Christians from Jerusalem. That's how he knew about these different episodes. It doesn't sound, when you read the gospel, like he really went up to Galilee, because he doesn't know the geography of Galilee that well. But he knows Jerusalem real well. So he learned about many of the gospel items there, company St. Paul, and he wrote Acts and Luke. And Acts of the Apostles concludes abruptly with Paul in house arrest in Rome in 62 with no mention of the outcome of Paul's trial. Why not? Because St. Luke probably didn't know. Uh, I don't think he knew what happened at the trial because it hadn't happened yet. And that's why he doesn't mention the destruction of Jerusalem. He finished writing the gospel and Acts by 62. The reason that's important is it puts the information and the witnesses he says that he met with within 30 years of the events of the life of Christ. Sometimes you see, oh yeah, this was written in the 80s. There's no reason to believe that. There's no evidence. And if anything, there's better evidence that he finished in 62. And, you know, as you go through life, um, it doesn't become that difficult to remember things from 30 years earlier. Um, some of us can remember things from more than 50 years ago. <laughs> I was watching a special on uh, the assassination of John F. Kennedy. And like most of us who were alive then, we can tell you exactly where we were when we found out the news, right? So it's um, very, very common to know those things. And that means he's a more reliable witness then some people might want to get. Also, he's called by St. Paul a um, physician. A little bit of evidence of that is when, he, uh, when Jesus talks about how it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle, St. Mark and St. Matthew use the word for sewing needle. In Luke's gospel, it's the word for surgical needle. You know, the apostles sewed clothes and such. St. Luke sewed up people. So that's why he's got that. All right. We are in Veritati Splendor. And uh, you, if you want to get a paperback copy of it, go to EWTN's Religious Catalog, either online, EWTNRC.com, or you can call 1-800-854-7000. 
6316 and order it there. If you prefer, you can download a free electronic copy of Veritatis Splendor from your computer by going to our website, ewtn.com, the main website. And if you look at the top, you'll see Faith tab. Click that. You'll see Document Library. Click that. Type in Veritatis Splendor, and you can download it for free. Also, we'd love to have you involved and participate in our show. You can do like these nice folks have from California and Texas to uh, be part of our audience. Or you can send a question by email, writing to threshold at ewtn.com. Or you can call during our live, our live broadcast. Live broadcast is Tuesday at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. And the phone number in North America is 1-800-221-9460. Outside North America, 205-271-2980. We are now on paragraph 102, where he, the Pope now is speaking about the relationship between grace from God and our obedience to God's law. Okay. He brings up a difficult situation that even in the most difficult situations, people must respect the norm of morality so that people can be obedient to God's holy commandment. So we, we have to do that, even in tough circumstances and at the same time be consistent with our own dignity as persons. This is very important. Obeying God's law in tough situations is what gives uh, respect for His authority as God and our own dignity. Certainly, maintaining a harmony between freedom and truth occasionally demands uncommon sacrifices. And it must be one at a high price, and it can even involve martyrdom. Now, I just read today, uh, a lot of people know that uh, Tim Tebow, who played, he was a Heisman winner, and he played football professionally for a little bit, now he's working on becoming a baseball player and such. His mother was told by the doctors to abort him because her life was at risk. Being a good Christian woman, uh, they're, they're uh, Protestant Christians, she would not do it. She was willing to risk her own life rather than kill the baby to save her life. And this is, hap I, it's amazing to me, how often I meet mothers and their children who were told that by doctors. And both, uh, obviously, uh, she's very much alive and doing fine. And Tim Tebow is, you know, very healthy, but uh, to say the least. And a good, good man. As a matter of fact, he's, if anything, he gets criticized for being good. I, think about our press. If you commit sins and get caught on tape, did you hear what he said? If you don't commit those sins and there's nothing to catch, can you believe what a goody-goody he is? You cannot make such people happy um, because they are incapable of happiness on their own. Good to point that out and be alert to it when they talk about things. But also that this being uh, faithful to, our, to the truth of God's commandment may bring on martyrdom. We see that going on in many countries today. Iraq has been one of the places where it's gone on the worst. And Syria. It was happening in Egypt during the so-called Arab Spring. And, you know, we saw ISIS kill those Christians. And I discovered recently that remember when they took those men in the orange suits the Coptic and Ethiopic Christians and killed them there was one guy who wasn't a Christian 
And they said, well, do you, uh, you know, we'll, we'll let you go. He said, no, I believe in their God. He didn't know who Christ was really. He didn't have a religion. But he said, you know, whatever they're willing to die for, that's my God. And so they killed him too. And of course, we see today that some people in our own politics are threatening freedom of religion, especially for us Catholics. Anywhere from trying to force us to pay for abortifacients or to uh, pay for contraception. They want to force us by the law to commit mortal sins. And that's the present administration. Or we see from Mrs. Clinton and from other people in her party who are saying that we have to have a revolution in the Catholic Church. We have to get the Catholic, well, the churches in general, when she spoke about to the United Nations in 2011, get all the churches to change so that they accept abortion and same-sex marriage. We have to pay attention to that. I don't know who win the election and such, but we have to be ready to say, I will stand more with Jesus Christ and his church than I will with what the government might try to tell me. This is a decision we better start thinking about now when they're making their threats to foment revolution inside the church and not wait to the last minute. If you want to be with those who side with Judas Iscariot, you can go with him. If you want to stay with the apostles and Christ, you can go with them, but we have to make these decisions. And it's better to think about it early than later. And then, as we also have to see that um, our own experience and the experience of all people is there are a lot of temptations to break the harmony between freedom of action, where I have free will, and my commitment to the truth of God's commandments and his revelation. A lot of times it'd be easy to, 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 to the temptation to say, well, you know, um, it'd be more fun to sin. And everybody else is doing it. God can't send all of us to hell, can he? Yeah, he could. But this is why St. Paul wrote about that temptation. He said in Romans chapter 7, verse 15, I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. For what I do not, for I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. Ask anybody who's addicted. You know how hard it is to do what they want. They want to give up drinking or drugs. They want to give up pornography. But at a certain point, they're so caught, they, they do what they don't want to do. And that's very common. What is the ultimate source of this inner division inside people? What is it in human beings that we want to be good, but it's so much fun to be bad? Or, um, you know, and even country songs will sing about how um, if uh, doing this is wrong, then I don't want to be right. You know, no, that's not a good policy. Um, um, at least not if you want to go to heaven. Human history of sin begins when people no longer acknowledge the Lord as their creator. That's where the um, uh, history of sin begins. And secondly, when people, human beings, with, uh, are, want to be the pe ones who determine completely independently of God what is right and what is wrong. Oh, God didn't know what he was talking about when he established uh, marriage as the relationship between a man and a woman. I'll fix it. God didn't know what he was doing when he let some people who didn't really want to have a baby get pregnant. So we'll fix it. We'll change the law. And God didn't know what he was doing. You can go on through all kinds of history. God didn't know what he was doing when he allowed there to be Jews, gypsies, homosexuals. We should just kill them all, as they did in the time of the Third Reich. 
or capitalists and small farmers and small landowners. God didn't know it. As a matter of fact, we don't care what God thought because we're atheists anyway. So let's just kill them too. People will do what they want. Oh, God didn't understand that black people don't have a dignity or a, a, of their own. They don't deserve freedom, so we should make them into slaves. Even though the church taught the opposite. When we make decisions contrary to what God said, we will justify anything we want, and we do. That's why in Genesis chapter 3, verse 5, how does the devil tempt him? He attacks God's motives. Oh, God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. That's how he tempts Eve. And this is something that it's easy. To, oh, yeah. So God's just jealous. He doesn't want me to, to get smarter. Oh, I better learn something. I don't care what he says. I'll do what I want. I mean, how will I know if it's bad unless I try it? I've heard that plenty of times. This was the first temptation, and that temptation echoes through all other temptations to which man is more easily inclined to yield because we are born with original sin. And, well, it's, you know, I'm already a little bit bad. Why don't I just get worse? Can't be that much bad, you know, worse to be worse than what I am. <laughs> but we have to remember, and this is part of being Christians, temptations can be overcome. When you overcome temptation... You, uh, you can avoid certain sins. You don't have to do it. Oh, you don't understand how strong the temptation is for me. Actually, you don't understand how strong it is for you. You only can find out how strong a temptation is if you don't give in to it at all. It's the people who give in to it that don't know how strong the temptation is. It could get worse but you would also become a stronger person inside of you if you don't give in to it. And this is uh, something that we have to keep in mind because together with his commandments, the Lord gives us the possibility of keeping them. So we see in the book of Sirach, chapter 15, verse 19 and 20, the Lord's eyes are on those who fear him. And he knows every deed of man. He has not commanded anyone to be ungodly. And he has not given anyone permission to sin. There's no list next to the Ten Commandments with your name on it saying, everybody else has to avoid adultery except you, 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 and you. No, it doesn't exist. And we're seeing today in our modern culture, as I alluded to, the internet and all the stuff that people put on there. I can't believe how many people have said to me over the years, well, why can't I just go to confession on the internet? <laughs> Need I give you any more reasons than what we see going on between Mrs. Clinton and Mr. Trump? <laughs> you know, and if the internet knows what you're up to, how much more God our Lord? Right? At least God will forgive you for your sins if you come to him and ask his, his mercy. The internet forgives nothing. Nothing. Keeping God's law in particular situations can be difficult, extremely difficult, as with Mrs. Tebow and many other women who are told that their lives are in danger if they have a child. Okay? Those are very difficult situations or situations of war such as the people of Iraq are dealing with. But it is never impossible, no matter how difficult it is. That's the constant teaching of the church. We see it stated at Trent in session 6, uh, chapter 11. It says, but no one, how much, how much soever justified, ought to think himself exempt 
from the observance of the commandments. No one ought to make use of the rash saying, one prohibited by the fathers under an anathema, that the observance of God's commandments is impossible for one that is justified. For God commands not impossibilities, but by commanding, he both admonishes you to do what you are able and to pray for what you are not able to do. And he aids you that you may be able, whose commandments are not heavy, whose yoke is sweet, and whose burden light. That's what Jesus said in Matthew 11, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Because he'll give us the grace. Remember a yoke, you know, have you ever seen uh, oxen, yoke for oxen? And it's usually two-sided, isn't it? Two things about that. Jesus was a, ca a carpenter, and St. Um, Justin Martyr says that he actually saw a yoke that Christ had made. Because St. Justin was from the Holy Land, and he was born there. And he said that it was very well made, but also it points out that our Lord knew how to make yokes. First of all, a yoke for an ox was custom made for that ox. It wasn't one size fits all. So that's one thing about us. Our temptations and difficulties are custom made for us. Secondly, it's two-sided. And with this, when he says, my yoke is easy, it's because Jesus is the other side pulling. And as in any ox pair, one ox is dominant in pulling over the other. Christ pulls for us more than we do the pulling. So this is something that we have to keep very much in mind in uh, dealing with temptation. Christ will be there to help us. Paragraph 103. He said, human beings always have before them the spiritual horizon of hope. Not optimism. Optimism is something that we come up with with our own plans and schemes. Oh, if we do this, this, and this. And we can see how human schemes and plans usually end up causing more problems than they solve when they go against God's commandments. Okay. So we have hope from God. And we have hope thanks to the help of divine grace and with the cooperation of human freedom. See, hope is a theological virtue with faith and love. That means God gives you the grace to have the hopes he sets before us rather than optimism about the schemes individual human beings devise. We'll make your life better. We'll make it that a, a good example. Communism was so filled with optimism of a perfect society. We'll create the workers' paradise. That was their promise, and that's what Marx said. But what they created was hell on earth for the people that lived there. Killing 61.9 million of their own citizens in Soviet Union, over 90 million of their own citizens in China, and the ones who survived still suffer from alcoholism, depression, and uh, all kinds of poverty and what a mess that they made of things. No, that's optimism. God's hope comes with his grace, but our free will must cooperate with the grace. It is the saving cross of Jesus Christ. That's one of our helps. The gift of the Holy Spirit. This is another tremendous aid that he gives. The sacraments which flow from the pierced side of the knee. Remember, blood and water flowed from his side in John chapter 19, verse 34. After the soldier pierced his side with a spear, and once there came out blood and water. That's the source of the sacraments. That, and it's in those that the believers find the grace and the strength always to keep God's holy law. So you go to communion frequently. You use the sacrament of confession when you sin. 
When your spouses, you as spouses, argue and fight with each other, use confession as a grace to help you stop fighting. When you're gossiping, sure, I keep saying the same thing over and over again. I'm always gossiping. I'll just save it up for Easter and Lent. No! Confess the gossiping well before Easter and Christmas, uh, all through the year. Uh, so, so to receive the grace and strength to keep God's law, even amid the, the gravest of hardships. Because if we don't keep it when it's easy, then it becomes more difficult to keep his law when things get tough. That's why St. Andrew of Crete in his Oratio Number 1 wrote, The law itself was enlivened by grace and made to serve grace in a harmonious and fruitful combination. Each element preserved its characteristics without change or confusion in a divine manner he, the Lord turned what could be burdensome and tyrannical, namely the law, into what is easy to bear and a source of freedom. So what, without God's grace, the law feels like tyranny. But with his grace, we can do it, and it gives us more freedom. Again, the, it's not a sin to drink, but it is a serious, a, a mortal sin to get drunk. People who don't get drunk are happier than the ones who get drunk. For one thing, they don't have hangovers. <laughs> they don't drive drunk and wreck their cars and all the other things. Lots of things happen. And the same with other sins. This is what you give up with sin. Some of the problems you cause by sin. People who don't commit fornication and adultery don't have to worry about the sexually transmitted diseases, the unwanted pregnancies, and the, the, the nasty breakups that occur. It gives you more freedom to obey God's law. Only in the mystery of the redemption by Jesus Christ do we discover the concrete possibilities for man. This is what we have to, to understand. That's why he goes on to say um, in uh, one of the teachings from the church, it would be a serious error, very serious error, to conclude that the church's teaching is essentially only an ideal, which must then be adapted, proportioned, graduated <coughs> to the so-called concrete possibilities of man according to a balancing of the goods in question. That, what he's, what's he saying there? Some people think, oh, you know, when John Paul was talking about responsible parenthood back in 84, some people were saying, well, you got to realize that not committing adultery is an ideal. Not having an abortion, not, having, uh, not, not using contraception, that's the ideal, but we'll work as close to it as we can. So no, that's not what we teach. Instead, um, he goes on to say, but what are the concrete possibilities of man? What can we do, really? And of which man are we speaking? Of man who is dominated by lust or of man redeemed by Christ? This is what we have to say. Well, you don't understand how difficult it is to overcome lust. Well, maybe, the, maybe he did know. Because he did overcome it. Again, the ones who don't give in to temptation understand it better. Now what he's, he goes on to say, this is what is at stake. The reality of Christ's redemption. Christ has redeemed us. This means that he has given us the possibility of realizing the entire truth of our being. Christ has set our freedom free from the domination of concupiscence. I don't have to get drunk. I don't have to get high. I don't have to watch pornography. I don't have to give in to drugs and all these other things. I don't have to give in to my anger. A big problem, uh, uh, more surveys keep showing in about today, this present election, and if redeemed man, he goes on, 
And if redeemed man still sins, this is not due to an imperfection of Christ's redemptive act. Christ didn't fail if we still sin. But to man's will not to avail himself of the grace that flows from the act of redemption. We have to seek it. That's where my will comes in. God's command is, of course, proportioned to man's capabilities, but to the capabilities of the man to whom the Holy Spirit has been given, of the man who, though he has fallen in, into sin, can always obtain pardon and enjoy the presence of the Holy Spirit. So this is what ought to define us. Not the sin, not that everybody is doing it. Oh, the culture has changed. No, it hasn't. Only dopes say that the culture is different than it ever used to be because they don't know anything about past culture. These are people who don't even know after, uh, I, there was a survey that just came out, an extraordinarily large number of people don't know after whom Washington, D.C. is named. Did they name it after the dollar bill? <laughs> well, if you don't know that stuff, then you don't know how bad cultures can be. Pagan culture before Christianity was full of this stuff. And sin was just okay. And there was chaos as a result. They weren't happy by any means. That's why they became Christians. And we can't give ourselves any excuses but rather we have to turn ever more deeply to Christ in our prayer, in our acts of faith, and in our time of committing ourselves to him through the sacraments so that we can live as he sets for us and not as the media set for us. They are not the norm for Christians. Maybe for the people going to hell, sometimes some of them might be. But for people going to heaven, Jesus Christ and the saints and Our Lady are the norm. All right, we'll take a break. We'll come back in just a minute, so please stay with us. Let's go right to our calls. We have John on the line. John, where are you calling from? Hey, Father Mitch. I'm calling from Delray Beach, Florida. Nice. And your question or comment? I just want to tell the people, you and I go back so far, and you're responsible for my coming back to the church 30 years ago. Thank wow. you so much. Oh, my pleasure. My, you know, my question is, mm -hmm. I uh, listen to Father Barron, uh, Bishop Barron now, and Father Spitzer, and they both say that uh, Jesus uh, does not condemn people to hell, that we, we do that ourselves through our choices uh, through life. Mm -hmm. And uh, the question is, in the Bible it says on the last day, Jesus will, uh, you know, judge everybody. Yeah. So, so how does that? Which, I, I, well, you know, I, I like Bishop Barron quite a bit. I've, he's been a welcome guest. And... Um, uh, and Father Spitzer is a good uh, friend as well. But when it comes to uh, their sense, I'm going to go with Scripture, you know, <laughs> and I'll tell them that too. But, uh, yeah, but here's, here's the point that they are making, that on one hand, uh, of course, Christ is the one who will judge us. You know, he's, he, he says so numerous times uh, that he'll be the judge of the living and the dead. This is church teaching. But he will judge us 
on what we have chosen to do. So the part that, you know, that they're trying to get at, I think, is that, yes, we make decisions that make us into hell bait or we make decisions that accept the grace of God and in accepting it, we get transformed. And that, that is a core decision we make. We're not just flotsam and jetsam flowing around the ocean of life and we can't do anything about it. This is the point where they are getting at, um, that we make some key decisions and that's very important to keep in mind that we make decisions as to accept the grace of God, to fight against temptation. Do we do, we do that? Or do we say, oh, I can't help it. I just, you know, God will understand and he won't mind if I commit this sin because I really like it. No, <laughs> no, no. Do you, uh, and even in the face of overcoming temptation or not, when people fail, but they're trying. Our Lord will see how much they tried and, you know, how they, they gave everything they could. And sometimes, you know, like parents, sometimes parents will let a kid fall flat on their face. Not these modern folks who are helicopter parents hovering over their kids all the time. Um, I hear complaints about that a lot. <laughs> People, this one guy even said, I'll take a pay cut at this company if I can only hire orphans because all these helicopter parents keep complaining if I don't give them a job. But at any rate, you know, but wise parents let their kids deal with failure, learn from their mistakes. And God does too. You know, he, because then as we fail, because we try to overcome temptation only by our own efforts. And he'll let us fail. I say, now, you willing to let me help you? You willing to get, let me you know, trust in my grace? Come on, let's move. Let's move forward. And, you know, the, the, uh, but the Lord will work with us when we desire, and he will know those core decisions and how we made them or how we just uh, blew it off. You know, that that will be key. I have a question from our studios. Ma'am, where are you from? Fort Worth, Texas. Ain't that something? I like Fort Worth. And what is your question? Well, I was wondering about the election. Um, there's not just two parties running. Um, I saw on the television. There are about five, five candidates out there. And um, somebody was telling me that they didn't want to vote for either of the two major candidates mm -hmm. because they didn't like either one, mm -hmm. and they said that they hadn't earned their That's vote. That's a general consensus. Go on. But they wanted to vote for one of the basically off-brands. Yeah. <laughs> and so I said if you did that, you were basically throwing your vote away mm -hmm. because it's going to be one right. or two of the majority. Right. And, and there are a couple things. You know, if somebody, you know, votes just because another candidate is different, I'm so disgusted by this, what, what looks like the uh, cast of the Jerry Springer show running for presidency, um, that this is something that I say, I can't take it anymore. I'm just disgusted by these people. I'm turning the channel to somebody else. If it's just that, that's not sufficient. But on the other hand, um, you know, that what they need to do is say, I'm choosing this candidate because they exhibit greater morality, a greater commitment to the Constitution than I see in the other candidates. Okay? Then that, that, that's a legitimate uh, position to take. Uh, just to be different? No, that's not enough. But to choose a more moral and uh, a candidate who is not going to try to attack our First Amendment rights, to take away our freedom of religion or try to get us to compromise the freedom of religion, our Second Amendment or our Fourth Amendment or our Tenth Amendment rights, 
um, you know, if, if somebody's going to maintain, you know, take the oath of office to uphold the Constitution and mean it, then, yeah, that's understandable. But we also have to make sure that the person is voting for some, uh, for the other candidates as well, all the way down to dog catcher, to make sure that all of them, you know, and this is part of our task, uh, uh, is to make sure that all of them are good candidates who are moral and virtuous and I have the wisdom to know how to obey the Constitution and, and uphold it. That's, that's what we're looking for, all the way down the line. All right, let's go now to Samuel. Samuel, where are you calling from? Calling from northern Wisconsin, Father. How's the weather up there yet? Oh, there's a Rembrandt around every corner with the trees turning colors. The Lord oh, is wonderful. Oh, pretty. That's nice up there. So what's your question, Samuel? My question, Father, my wife has worked many years with the mentally challenged, mentally disabled. God bless her. And I was just wondering in God's plan mm -hmm. for these people to make choices and decisions when yeah. you're mentally disabled. You know, as uh, I'm sure that she has shared with you over the years, mental disability is not either or. It's, it's kind of a spectrum, isn't it? Some people have more abilities, some have almost no abilities, you know, mentally. Uh, there's some people who, who just are, uh, it's nearly impossible to, 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 to talk or do, make any decisions. And there are a couple things. I'll never forget when I was uh, taking my first sociology class back in 68, I think it was, or maybe 69, um, a point was made by a sociologist that societies who killed off the physically or mentally disabled tended to become more violent societies. And they used as examples, uh, among others, uh, Sparta in Greece and Rome. In Rome, if you wanted to pick up a, a kid, you could go to the garbage dump every night, and there were kids set out there for the wild dogs to eat. Every night, there were, there were, there were babies. Uh, and the Christians used to go and pick them up and rescue them. But um, society, on the other hand, they point out that societies that preserved their lives and cared for them were more gentle societies. And I would say that there, there's one of the things with the mentally disabled, and I see this in the families where mentally disabled and physically disabled people live. They are a gift to the family. It's a tough gift. I mean, it requires a little bit more work, to be sure, a lot of sacrifice. But that is also something that is... Um, uh, it ennobles them. They, they realize what a, what, what a help these kids are to them in becoming more gentle. So it's not just society at large, but individuals find themselves being made better so that the gift of the mentally disabled and phys physically disabled is for the rest of us, that as we give of ourselves to them and help them, they make us better people. And when they have, you know, again, it varies. Some of them have a pretty good, you know, fairly good sense of right and wrong, and some don't. You know, so our Lord is going to judge them by the ability that they have, not by you know, the standards of Einstein, all right? No, that's just not going to happen. But he will use them. And again, just like, you know, you know uh, any child, you know, when you have a baby and it's one and a half or so, they already get the look that they're about to do some mischief, do they not? And they look to see what are you going to do? Moms, dads, am I wrong? 
<laughs> and then you, and you have to deal with them because even their own small minds, they have some sense of good and evil. And our Lord will take care of them on that line. All right, we have another question here from email from Richard in Prairieville, Louisiana. Dear Father Mitch, I do not understand indulgences. When I was young before Vatican II, I viewed indulgences like receiving a reduction in a prison sentence. Now I understand that purgatory is a process of final preparation for heaven. I do not see how an indulgence could help in that process. I'm confused about the purpose and effect of indulgences, such as the papal blessing, which is given at the end of a Jesuit retreat, which I end. I, I know over in Convent, Louisiana, that Jesuit retreat house is always full. What benefit are they to me? Can they be dedicated to someone else? And if so, what is the effect? Richard in Prairieville, Louisiana. You know, one of the things that we're dealing with, with indulgences, is the effects of sin. You know, there, uh, when we commit sins, it's not only the judgment of the case that that was wrong. Are you uh, guilty or not guilty? And if you are guilty, are you sorry or not sorry? Do you want forgiveness or don't you? Right? That would be, well, that's a very juridical kind of approach. But there's also the effects of the sins. So that, you know, if you break a window, you can be very sorry. I, I was sorry. I was sorry I played base. I, I was uh, hitting the baseball in the backyard. I was sorry I broke the window and so very sorry that I got caught. Now I sound like a politician. And so the, uh, but then I still had to do restitution. I had to not only pay for the window, but I had to put it in there, caulk it, let it dry and get it, give it back to the owners. Right? That's, and that's a good thing for me to learn that. So it's not just that I'm sorry, I have to deal with the effects of my sin. An indulgence would be when my dad, well, in that case, lent me the money until I could pay, for, pay him back by, you know, my paper route and stuff like that. So that the indulgence would be this gift to deal with the uh, punishment due to the sin, the effects of the sin, to undo them. And in that case, to undo it faster than if the guy with the broken window would wait for me to earn enough money to pay for the glass. Because I didn't make that much money then. I was 10 years old. And so this is the kind of thing where an indulgence helps you with that situation. Does that make sense? And, uh, but in the case of... Um, you know, eternal life and purgatory, it's dealing with the effects of our sins that need to be cleansed. You can't bring those effects. People may have sinned against lust, but you can't bring those lustful thoughts to heaven. God forgives you, but they need to be cleansed and transformed. Uh, anger. No, you can't just say, well, I was angry, I'm sorry, and I'm sure you are, and God forgives you. But the you can't say, but every time I think of that person, you know, no, that has to be cleansed and healed. So that's what the indulgence helps with. Okay. And yes, you can apply that to people who already died. All right, we have another caller. Hello, Eve. Hi. Hello. Hi. Where are you calling from? Mississippi. Great. And what is your question? Um, you spoke very well about the difference between freedom to worship and freedom of religion. Yes. I'd like you to take a similar take on error, deliberate rebellion. Um, sure. I'm very unfamiliar with Catholic phraseology. Yeah. Um, discuss that topic, and I don't know how to ask the question properly. I think, I, as a matter of fact, you're dealing with a distinction that you see in the Old Testament. Um, the Old Testament has a number of words for sin. And one of them, like a word that you mentioned, error, is shigaga, shigaga. This Hebrew word comes from sheep 
who wander off. Sheep are not very bright. They're not, they're, 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 matter of fact, they're kind of dumb. And so they can wander off on their own and get into trouble even though they're just looking for grass to eat or maybe some persimmons or some other fruit that they know they, they like to eat fruit too. And they're just wandering off and they don't realize that they've wandered far away from the rest of the herd and they're in trouble. Oftentimes, we, you know, especially younger people, will be induced by their friends to commit sins. They don't even realize how bad it is. They don't know, as a matter of fact, they don't know that it's going to end up being very bad. And they do very dumb things that become very dangerous. Okay? That happens a lot to young people. And uh, that would be error. Whereas rebellion, and in Hebrew the word is pesha. Pesha is when you know that something is wrong, that it's a sin. And you choose to do it because it's wrong. This would be, uh, classic examples would be the way uh, dictators like the, the communists or the, the uh, Nazis would on purpose attack churches. They on purpose stop people from having freedom of religion and, for, uh, and, and close the churches down. They want them to sin. The government, uh, I, I think that a good idea of rebellion would be President Obama, who had said he would not impose on Catholics abortion and birth control. And then seven weeks later, went against his word. You know, that would be rebellion. Attacking our, it was explained to him that this is against our conscience. Cardinal Dolan met with him in the White House. He agreed with the Cardinal and his word meant nothing. That's rebellion. And that's a very serious sin. So that would be, hopefully that helps it. And we, we, we understand that difference. Um, you know, people who are just making an uh, error are not necessarily culpable. Um, let's see. All right, let's, let's get a, this is from Jerusalem. Okay. Um, dear Father Pacwa, in 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 23 to 25, we read where two small boys were taunting Elisha and he cursed them in the name of the Lord, after which two bears came out of the woods and killed them. Actually, um, Henry, he mauled them. He didn't say that they died. Um, the, when you take a look at the Hebrew again, I know it's, a, it's harsh. I mean, I wouldn't want to be mauled by any animal, uh, including a bear. But it was the, that, that they got mauled. Who is it that God, to kill those children for such a minor um, offense. You see, the God that our Lord Jesus Christ is talking about, it always seems that there's so many things in the Old Testament that should not be there. It can easily disturb many believers. Henry in Palestine. Well, Henry, and a couple things. In that, Elisha had just become a prophet. And one of the things that's going on is he's establishing his authority at an early stage when throughout the country, Queen Jezebel, who had been, who was reigning at the time, was trying to change the religion of Israel so the people would worship Baal, do human sacrifice, kill their babies as sacrifices. And she was trying, she was punishing those who obeyed the religion. And Elisha was showing, and again, the word would be, I, I translated that text, and it more has a sense of mauling them without necessarily killing them, but a serious punishment to let them know this is the, the great strength. Now, over time, Israel does learn about another side of God, but at this point, um, they're, they're, they're learning a tough lesson about you don't mess with God, his religion, or his prophets. You can't do that. But I can't mess with time either. May the Lord bless you and keep and cause his face to shine upon you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
And again, we can bring you this program and all our other programs and specials only because you bring it to you. You make it possible. So keep us in between your gas bill, electric bill, and cable bill, and we'll pay our bills. Thank you.